been an amazing day so far. I'm so honored to have been invited to be here with you today and to share this story. So uh, let's go to Midway. Uh, I need a clicker. Hold on. There we go. Well, about three years ago, I found myself along with a small team of documentary filmmakers uh, on, on a small airplane heading to this remote island in the middle of the Pacific. And why we were going there was to, um, to do a film and a photography project about this phenomena that many of you may have heard of and, and we were hearing about at the time called this Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's, this, it's said to be this island of plastic floating out there in the middle of the Pacific, twice the size of Texas. Uh, if you talk to the Europeans, it's a, twice the size of France. And yesterday I actually looked up and found out that it's one and a half times the size of BC to bring it really close to home. So it's really big and it's huge and we had this vision that it's a place you can literally you know, bring your boat up to and dock next to it and it's like this island, horizon to horizon of plastic. And the more research that we, we did, we actually realized and learned that this is not the case. This uh, island doesn't exist. It is actually a little bit worse than that and that is that plastic that's floating out there is diluted through all the oceans. So there is conversion zones where we have a little bit more of it, but if you went out there in a boat, it just looks like the wide open ocean. You throw a net in and you troll for a little while, you'd be surprised what you'd pull out. So, um, so we talked to a scientist at the time who shared with us that if we wanted to go make a film about the garbage patch and about this pollution issue that's happening in the oceans, that we need to go to this little place called Midway where, uh, where the plastic is showing up in the bodies of these little baby albatross chicks who are dying with it in their stomachs on this little island in the middle of the ocean. So we were rather surprised to hear this and, and so hopped on Google right away and we found some low resolution images, JPEGs, of truly these, these decaying birds laying on the ground with plastic bottle caps and all this plastic junk in their stomachs and we actually were uh, so shocked by it that we thought there's no way. This is photoshopped, it's just some visit, visitor to the island that put the plastic there. This can't actually be happening. Why are we not hearing about this? What, you know, what, what's going on? But that's what gave us the fuel to go there and to, to learn more and to find out if this phenomenon is actually happening. So um, there is our ride to Midway, 1962 Gulfstream airplane. And uh, <laughs> I like to kind of compare Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. Everybody remember that film when the, he gets in the plane and the, the chicken is running around? Literally the bananas and the broccoli were strapped in the seat next to me in this thing. And I will never forget looking out that window as we're flying five hours over that wide open ocean, literally seeing the oil coming out of that engine and dripping down and dripping off the end of the wing as we're flying out there thinking, please get us there in one piece in this antique machine. Anyway, it was an amazing experience. We did get there safely. However, less than a year later, there was a full um, plane full of people coming back from Midway in that exact same plane and one of the engines did explode and catch on fire, and they made a U-turn, went back to Midway, everybody survived, but they don't use that plane anymore. <laughs> so, um, you may have heard of Midway because of, uh, well, there it is, first of all. Um, two by four kilometers in size, pretty small place. It's the uh, emergency landing site for all the Trans-Pacific flights, so the, air the, air the runway is fairly big. Uh, but you might have probably heard of it mostly through the, the, the Battle of Midway. That's where the most decisive naval hap battle happened, you know, exactly 70 years ago this month. And uh, so the history of that is still present today by some of the images you see here. So the, the, it's, it's fascinating to, to visit and, and to just think about all those lives and all the people that, that were there over all those years. So today, Midway is a uh, part of one of the largest protected marine national monuments in the world. It's a protected area. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife have full jurisdiction of it. There's about 60 full-time people that, that live there, kind of come and go, contractors, biologists. And uh, it is one of the biggest concentrations of, of wildlife is on this, on this little island. There's over 3 million birds on this place, and it's an incredible sight. And um, you need a pretty stringent permit to go there. There's no visitors really allowed. You have to have a purpose and a reason to go. And um, when, we, uh, we, you know, when we got there, it was incredible to just to see this incredible abundance of, of, uh, of the wildlife. And uh, the primary re resident of Midway is uh, the Lazan albatross. And 
There's over one and a half million of them on this little tiny island. They go there and nest each year to have their babies. And it is an incredible experience when you can go up to a bird like this and, and, and film them for about, from about six inches away. <laughs> they have no fear of humans, no fear of predators. They're, it's amazing. We brought all these telephoto lenses and we didn't use any of them. <laughs> we were filming them all with these wide angle lenses. It was incredible. And they're very curious birds. Um, and they're just absolutely stunning. They have up to an 11-foot uh, wingspan, so they're really, really big. So uh, what happens is that these little, little guys you know, hatch out of their eggs, and the parents uh, fly out over the Pacific looking for food that floats on the surface of the ocean. So that, you know, some of those items would be uh, krill and, and flying fish eggs and squid and those kind of things. And that's what they eat off the surface, fly back to Midway, and that's what they feed to their babies. And for about six months, that's the process that goes on until the chick is big enough to, so he could fly um, away from the island on its own. So um, I have a little clip here just to show you um, of Chris Jordan, who is a dear friend and a, a renowned uh, artist and photographer and uh, the director of our, of our film that we're working on out on Midway. And it just kind of shows you a little bit, just with a little point and shoot camera, what it's like when these guys just kind of sit there on their own without any fear of, of, of people. So here it is. In the short time we've been out here, the babies have grown big enough that their parents can now leave them alone on their nests while the parents go out and search for food over the ocean. So now the island is covered with all these sweet little hatchlings sitting by themselves, alone in their nests, totally exposed to the wind and the rain and the sun. And at night, the Milky Way is overhead, like they're exposed to the whole universe and held in, uh, in safety. So here's one little dude. Hey, dude. And there's another one right over there. Another one right over here. They're like little sneeches on beaches. There's another one right over there. <laughs> yeah, you got, this is the part where you say something really smart to finish the video at the end. And now I'm supposed to say something really smart and deep and philosophical and I just, all I feel is filled with joy. <laughs> Cheers from Midway. So we, we filmed that just a few months ago, and our team is actually heading back to Midway next week, and we're going to be seeing these babies uh, fledging the island. It's the season of the year that they, they leave. But so when we got there the first time three years ago, and we got off that airplane, it only took a few steps away from the plane until we found the very late first chick, and there it is. And we were surprised, we were shocked, we were thinking, wow, we found one, this is actually happening. So we probably took a couple hundred pictures of just that one, and uh, you know, we didn't really have to walk very far, because just right over there was, was another one. Another, and another. And because we were so shocked by those JPEGs that I shared with you about earlier, we had a strict rule you know, amongst our team to not manipulate and touch any of the plastic in any of these birds. Those pictures were going to be 100% authentic, documentary style, looking straight down, exactly how we found them. And uh, so that's how we took all of these. But um, when we came back the second time to the island, um, we, we expanded our rules a little bit, where we were now allowed to touch the plastic and, and expand it, because what we had learned that once we took some of this plastic out of these birds after we took that first set of photos, 
um, there was like a whole depth to it that you couldn't really see in any of those pictures. So the second trip, we would find the chicks laying on the sand like that, and we would take the time to actually open them up, and there's what was inside that one. And then we found one like this on a runway, and that's what was inside of him. So it was a pretty shocking experience to witness this firsthand. Um, and I actually brought some of this plastic with me to share with you today. So every single one of these uh, items came out of these baby albatrosses on the remotest island on our planet. And whatever feeling that you guys are having right now, as uncomfortable as it is, that's really what I believe is the fuel that could, that could, that could drive passionate change within us. That's the fuel. So whatever it is, feel it and embrace it, because that's we can do something with that. So I became really interested um, how this stuff gets there. Oh yeah, and I've got another little piece here. What you're looking at there is this right here. I can show you later if you want, but we, find, we found these chicks in this kind of state as well where they don't necessarily die right away, but they're affected by it as they live. And uh, we watched an adult trying to feed that chick and was having a really hard time. And so the next day we came back and we were going to rescue him, trying to pull it off. And just by miracle, somehow the peas did fall off and we found it right next to the nest. But um, what I also learned recently is that this is not happening just to the albatrosses. If you Google some of this stuff, camels in the Middle East, one out of two camels in the Middle East dies because of eating plastic, plastic bags. They're finding camels just filled with plastic. India, the same thing. They're having a huge issue with these cows that look like they're pregnant, falling over, dying. They're like, what's going on? And they're full of plastic. They're just eating it off the street. So it's affecting more than just, uh, just the albatrosses. It's affecting uh, turtles as well. So I became interested, how does this stuff get there? And I followed the river. I followed the path of the water. The scientists tell us that 80% of all this material gets into the ocean out of our rivers. So it's not the fishing industry, it's not cruise ships, it's not the stuff that we kind of automatically think, oh yeah, it's, it's the boats. No, it's, it's all of us. And um, so in our case, Astoria, Columbia River, Okanagan River, you know, so, you know, across the border, Soyuz Lake, Vasu, Skaha, the channel, right to Okanagan Lake, to this incredible place that you can see behind me here. And uh, what I, did just a few months ago is walk a little stretch of beach right here by Abbott Street, and this is what I picked up in a matter of about 10 minutes. That's the second box. I'm not going to dump this one, but it's pretty much the exact same stuff that is here. We don't see a lot of the soft plastics because that stuff sinks in seawater or you know, breaks down much quicker, but bottle caps, cigarette lighters, single-use items, which is by far the majority of what this is. It's made out of a material that's last, designed to last forever, but we use it for five minutes. And that's got to change. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, just yesterday I walked a little section of beach here as well. Where's the beach? That way. Yeah, same thing. Little line along the beach, plastic bags floating. I mean, the lake is full of it. And that's our drinking supply, in case anybody, <laughs> right? That's where we get our water from. So that's a whole other issue. But anyway, um, it gets there from our landfills, it flies. With the wind, it ends up in our storm drains just outside here. Have a look outside our front door. Where does all that stuff go? Right into the lake, right out the river, right into the ocean. So what are the solutions? Um, there's um, lots of them. Oh, okay, one more, one more quick story. And then I found a shoe. <laughs> I found a shoe here on the shore, and then uh, only a few weeks earlier, I actually found the other uh, half of that pair on Midway. There's Chris with the other half of that pair. Right? Not really, but right? Could very well be. That's how did it get there? So we grew up with this thing called reduce, reuse, recycle. Right? The three R's, they're in order of their priority. Did anybody know that? 
that, that actually we're supposed to like do the reduce first, reuse, and then last resort recycle. Well, what I learned is that uh, recycling is actually not all that's cracked up to be with plastic. That we actually don't really recycle plastic, but we downcycle it. So the items that actually do end up in some kind of recycling stream, which is about 8% of plastic globally, it gets downcycled into other products that end up being landfilled one day anyway. Things like carpeting and material from fleeces and park benches and stuff like that. So if anybody thinks that this bottle is somehow going to magically turn into another one of these bottles once you put it into that bin, that's not the case. <laughs> and, um, and we really have to think about that. That, uh, that recycling is not the answer. So we've added a couple more R's to this list, and um, I think they're even more important than the three that we have there. First one is that we really have to radically rethink you know, what the heck we are doing and, uh, and stop this throwaway culture. Again, materials that are, that are des you know, designed to be used for a few minutes made out of a material that lasts forever. Um, that's got to change. And we also have to think about and look at the reality of what we're seeing with these, you know, all this effort now. Like, like, don't you, I mean, great effort here, by the way, with the paper plates and all that stuff, but then we see these. And I know I, I see them in the stores, and I'm like, whoa, well, it's green, oh, Coca-Cola, these guys are so awesome. They're like now making green bottles, making, you know, out of grass, I guess, I don't know what it is, but anyway, 30% plant material. Well, guess what, it's still plastic. In fact, it's actually messing up the traditional recycling system, this new stuff. And that turtle or that albatross does not give a rip what this is made of. It's still going to kill it, right? So it may break down in the environment in 800 years instead of, instead of 1,000. It's still plastic. So don't let anybody fool you when you're at the checkout stand and they're telling you, oh, no, our plastic bags are biodegradable. It's still plastic. It's a bunch of, bunch of crap. Um, one more, and that's we've got to refuse. We have to refuse this material. We have to have the courage to refuse it. And to say, you know what, enough. We don't want, to, we don't want this stuff. We have to have the courage when we go out to eat and, and, you know, and we see the styrofoam plates lining up there behind the vendor, the food vendor, to say, hey, excuse me, do you have something else you can put my food on? And they say, uh, no, we don't. Say, well, I'm sorry, I can't buy my food here. And then go to the next place and tell them, I'll come back when you've got something more sustainable and better for the environment. How many of us would, you know, would it take in a given day at the food court here to do that for that shop owner to say, ooh, wait a minute, I'm kind of losing business by having these plates that are really bad for the environment, I should maybe get something else. So then you make your way down the line until you get to the Greek place that has these cool, you know, <laughs> recyclable uh, paper things that are way better. So some of those, um, that's just one example. There's so many more. You know, refusing to take out coffee cup with the plastic lid and ask for a cup for here. Look at, you know, I go to a coffee shop and the majority of people sitting there have the, the throwaway cups with the plastic lid when they're sitting there drinking coffee. Why not? have the reusable one, and have the courage with, these, uh, with the shop owners about this, to talk to them about it. Um, it's really exciting to see some of the, you know, the movements that are happening around the world, and I mean, we see examples like this. I mean, you know, years ago that would have been just a garbage bin, and now we have the little recycling uh, hole there, right, Tim Hortons? But then I was sitting there and I saw the dude come by to actually empty the trash can, and look what I found. So who here would be furious and filled with rage and do something if you saw that? That's just one of many examples of this greenwashing that's going on, making us feel all good, you know, no different than this stuff, all in an effort just to get you to keep consuming, consuming, and not give a second thought what actually happens to this stuff. We have to rethink, and we have to refuse it. And so it's so exciting to see these you know, these plastic bag bans happening all over the world. Los Angeles just banned plastic bags. Toronto just banned plastic bags. Bit of a surprise that they didn't plan that one. Mayor's not all that happy, but voila, awesome. <laughs> and you know, you know which town is next, right? You guys gonna help us, like, do that? Can we do that together? Like, <laughs> right? I think, I think the evidence is there that it's not good for our planet. Um, and it just takes a handful of us. I learned recently that this whole uh, styrofoam thing, you know, McDonald's, you guys remember the Big Macs and the McDLTs used to come in, in the styrofoam containers? Well, that was a grassroots group of people that started back in the late 80s that said, enough, this stuff is so bad for the environment, let's change it. And in three years, they did it. That was before Facebook, before Twitter, before, like, right? Well, look at the power we have now to make that kind of change. And so many other restaurants followed suit. So I love this thing that, uh, 
David Suzuki is doing right now, this thing you know, that says to be radically Canadian. Have you guys seen that? Like to be radical, become radical about some of this stuff and become passionate about, about just speaking up for some of these things. Because together we can do that. And it's no different than the smoking on airplanes. You know, only until the 80s, you know, people used to be able to light up right next to you on the plane. How would you guys respond if you got on a plane today and somebody lit, you know, lit up right next to you? What would you do? <laughs> like, how would you respond? Well, the day will come that when somebody takes one of these out of their bag next to you at the coffee shop or the plane, it'll be the same kind of response. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> and that day is coming really soon, and it's so exciting. Well, I'd love to share with you. I know I'm kind of running short on time here, but I've got to, I have, I'd love to share a trailer for our film with you, and then, uh, then I'm done. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> Okay, one more thing. I found that online, and I did Photoshop this, and I added this. Check this out. Come on. Ah. That's the more important one, right? Before you pull it off the shelf, think about where is this going to go afterwards. have the courage to face the realities of our time and allow ourselves to feel deeply enough that it transforms us and our future. On a journey through the eye of beauty. Across an ocean of grief. And beyond. take viewers on a lyrical guided tour into the depths of their own spirit, delivering a profound message of beauty, grief, reverence, and love. We're absolutely blown away by the response to this trailer. About a week and a half ago, we had our top day as far as views. It was watched 108,000 times 
in one day. It's almost the population of Kelowna. Couldn't believe it. It's up at 4.1 million plays. It's not hits. That's actually people watching it. And uh, so we're just thrilled that it's, people are connecting with it so much. And it was actually Nicole, who you're going to hear from next, who's a dear friend who shared with me recently that, 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 that the reason that she feels and I think the response we're getting is that, is that it's so actionable. Right? Like people connect with this story to say, hold on a sec, I could stop this and make a difference right now. Right now. Which is so exciting. One of the uh, last things I'll just wrap up with here is we're so thrilled that we're in the middle of actually our Kickstarter campaign, which is a crowdsource funding for our film to help us kind of take it to the next level, go back to Midway once or twice more and finish the film next year. So uh, we've kind of given the world an opportunity to join us and to, to pitch in. And we have some really cool giveaways. Chris Jordan signed pictures to, as rewards. So, so please join us and spread the word so we can uh, finish this movie and get it out to a, to a billion people. That's our goal. Um, in the olden days, uh, they used to use canaries in the coal mines because the canaries were sensitive to methane and dangerous gases. And it was a little indicator, really, for the miners that if the canary would stop singing, the Miners knew it was time to get out. There was dangerous gases present. What it didn't mean was to go and try to wake up and revive the canary, right? <laughs> they knew there was something bigger at play. And I kind of look at the story the same way. And it was this uh, Hawaiian elder that shared with us uh, before we went to Midway the first time that we are not to look at the albatrosses as victims, but to look at them as messengers, that they're trying to bring us a message. And, uh, and I feel that the message is an incredibly urgent and a really, really important one and that we need to start listening. Thank you so much.